the Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Welcome to this week's episode of the Pediatric Lounge. With you is your co-host and co-founder, Dr. Herb Bravo. Also with us today will be Dr. George Rogu, who, as you may know, is the president and CEO of a clinically integrated network in Long Island, New York. He has used data in data dashboards to implement best practices across independent pediatric practices in Long Island, New York, with much success over the years. Our guests today are good friends of mine who I've known for many years and I'm very proud and honored to host them today in the lounge. Dr. Renad Betas is professor of the University of Pennsylvania, Paramount School of Medicine, and director of implementation science at the Nudge Unit. She has been appointed the chair and Ralph Silk Paffenberger, professor of medical social sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. She will start that position September 1st. Dr. Sadi Betas, her father and my good friend, is an internist and infectious disease specialist with a master's in clinical informatics. He's also the co-author of the only published article that I have, which we published from Southwest Virginia many years ago, and I am very proud of that. You might ask why I have these three persons today on the, in the lounge. Well. Renat's research broadly focuses on leveraging insights from implementation science and behavioral economics to make it easier for clinicians, leaders, and organizations to use the best practices to improve the quality and equity of healthcare and enhance health outcomes. This is of paramount importance to all pediatricians who seek to remain independent, using data to improve care, implementing best practices, and proving value so that they can maintain their margins in their practices. Welcome, and I look forward to the next 45 minutes together. Dr. Renan, what a pleasure to see you again. You've grown some since the days when I met you. It's lovely to see you too. I think it's been a long time. I think the last time we saw each other was in that uh, house in Maryland on the, on the water. Oh, yes, Miles was one. So it's been eight years. Yes. And Dr. Sadi, what a pleasure to see you again, my good friend. You don't look any older. The years have gone by, but you look just as young as when I met you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you remember uh, back in the early 90s, uh, up in Appalachia is where we met. Um, we were up in uh, rural America um, taking care of business up there. Yeah, that was quite an experience. So today we're going to talk about something that's always been very difficult for pediatricians. That's why we don't become internal medicine doctors is getting people to do what they need to do to improve healthcare. And that's why many of us won't do adult medicine because we don't want to take care of the heart attack after they not taken their hypertension medicines for 20 years. Um, but that also uh, parlays or moves into uh, what is happening in medicine. We know so many different ways of making healthcare better, and we don't get to implement it. Um, and uh, Renaud specializes in innovation and implementation science. So hopefully we'll be able to tie everything together. How do we persuade doctors that data is not evil? How do we measure? And once we uh, elucidate a best practice, how do we get it into the community so that patients benefit, because at the end of the day, that's a, uh, what we're all trying to do. Um, so Sadi, uh, you got a master's in clinical informatics, and what do we do with that? What do we do with that? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so clinical informatics is mostly about the interface between computers and um, information. And then the physicians, uh, the uh, technologists, they have difficulty communicating with the clinicians in terms of developing things for them. 
um, and showing them what uh, you know, showing them what can be done. And the physicians have difficulty in terms of communicating what they want with the technology people. So clinical informaticists, they kind of come in between and they help bridge that gap uh, so that ultimately the physicians or healthcare providers get what they need. So how is that difference from UX or user, user interface design? Uh, so your user interface design is just those, uh, those people who develop software. They're really programming applications uh, and users are using these applications. Uh, so typically you may have physicians that get involved uh, as well as others who may be using the platforms uh, and they uh, work together to develop them. Okay. And Renad, you have a fascinating trajectory for such a young person. Um, you are at UPenn School of Medicine for the moment. Later on, you'll be going to Northwest, right? And you study the science of implementation and are director of the Nudge Center, which is part of the um, uh, Innovation Center at the Medical yeah. School of Philadelphia. Um, before we get into implementation science, it's a little bit um, interesting to me because I think the medical schools is moving very slow, as you point, on your, point out on your article. It takes 17 years from when you have an idea to when it becomes clinical practice. That innovation will take 17 years, and I feel the medical schools are very slow to change. So why would a medical school have an innovation center? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and we've had an innovation center at Penn Medicine for 10 years, which I think is um, one of the first, uh, if not the first, I'd have to check on that uh, innovation center in a med school. Um, you know, I think we recognize that healthcare is changing rapidly um, and that in order to meet the needs of patients, clinicians, organizations, that we need to have an innovation center where we can incubate best and latest ideas um, and then rapidly scale them as we demonstrate their promise. And so I think of the Innovation Center as being a really special place where people come together to think innovatively and outside of the box, uh, outside of the traditional paradigm to solve seemingly intractable problems and then to scale them uh, once we identify the best solution. Okay. And then the science of implementation, I, my understanding or how I would do, because I, I, I talk a lot to patients, so I dumb it down, is uh, what in Virginia, when your dad and I were working in rural Virginia, we called it the last mile. So you can get internet all over the country, but you can't get internet to that farm that's a mile from the road because it's not viable uh, yeah. for Fios or Comcast. And I can, I can tell you that I knew uh, when I was working with your dad that the best practice was to give a beta blocker to every patient that left the hospital after a heart attack. And the studies over and over again showed that 50% of the time they're left without a beta, beta blocker. So to me, it's the same analogy, that last step of bringing the science and best practices into the care arena. And I think that's what you're trying to solve in a big picture. You nailed it. Okay. And you want to uh, come work, work with me? I'm all in. <laughs> yeah, I would love to work with you. That would be a dream, right? I worked with your dad first and then I did work with you. <laughs> um, so that's what you do. And there are some steps. I love your analogy of the metro. And I want to walk our viewers or listeners a little bit through that. So the first step to me, would be what uh, George and your dad do, which is to collect data. Mm -hmm. The second step would be to elucidate best practices from that data. And the third step would be in a control environment to uh, find actionable data points that will change outcomes. Once we get there, then 
it gets really complicated. <laughs> well, and the pathway to where you just were is also really complicated, right? In terms of like, who's collecting the data? What's the evidence? Um, what are the studies that have been done to date? Who's driving that process? Um, so it's not so it's not as simple, right? Uh, you you laid it out so eloquently and and um, uh, in a linear fashion, but of course we know that healthcare doesn't function in, in that way. Correct. And then um, it's more complicated because, as you pointed out, this is the first time I've I've heard a researcher or read a researcher say this. Uh, once you go from a totally controlled environment, double blind, randomized studies you know, well-designed, it's gotten approval by a review board, uh, is a, you know, good researcher with no biases in, into the system. Um, and we go to a real clinic or a hospital or a community, then all is gone. We start all over again because what work in a very controlled environment may not work on the ground. So that's the first challenge that we find. If we can validate the information, then we would go into trying to learn how to uh, find barriers and find uh, champions or uh, things or people who would help us implement this best practice. And that's the last step. And that's the focus of your science. Yes, yeah, I might elaborate a little bit on that that latter part in thinking about um, you know identifying care gaps and I think you built that into the first part of, of your pathway um, identifying best practices that we want to deploy um, you know doing contextual inquiry to understand um, why things aren't being done and usually there are multiple levels and just in hearing you describe the use cases in which you were describing there's patient level barriers there's clinician level barriers there's team clinic, organizational health system, and then outer setter, outer, outer setting barriers, uh, which include the broader socio-political context, um, as well as facilitators. And then we want to design our implementation approaches to leverage our kind of diagnostic process of what might be getting in the way, and then measure proximal outcomes to implementation, such as, you know, penetration, how many patients are getting the thing they should get over the number eligible. Um, or how well a clinician does something, as well as the patient outcomes that we typically spend most of our time thinking about in, you know, um, effectiveness and pragmatic clinical trials. Okay. Um, and then George, you were able to get a bunch of silos together into one dashboard that collects sure. data. Um, how did you sell the physicians and data? Because when I talk to physicians about data, the first thing they say is, I don't need to measure. Yeah. I'm a great doctor. I run a tight ship. Yes, they all say that. I think most, especially pediatricians, they do the right thing. They do the, the quality metrics. They don't even know they're doing it. The problem is the technology, all right? They, they need to have something easy because doctors are busy people. They're busy, you know, saving the day. Um, you know, they can't be bothered with checking little boxes. And, you know, when, when they went with the EHRs, that's what they mandated. Check off these little boxes for very little benefit or outcome. Um, now it's fast forward to population health. Um, and we're, we're, we're asking these busy physicians to do more stuff. Like you, you guys say you do it in controlled environments and this and that. And the other thing, you, you formulate things, you, you, you make plans. You know what? It's great because you guys work in an institution, in a place, but we work with people. We're like the Marines. We work with people. All right. And you're asking the physicians to do things that they don't see as maybe immediately important. And it's just intrusive to their way of life. And then the computers, they're, some of them are pretty clunky. You got to get the data out. They don't know how to get the data out. And you have to put it somewhere. So it has to be non-intrusive, has to be easy to use. It has to be in your face without thinking. And then you have to be able to pull it out pretty quickly. And then you have to make use of it to give it to people back at the institution level to make sense of it, you know? Yeah. You know uh, uh. Sadi, um, from your experience and your master, 
how, how do you sell? How do you make it more palatable to physicians to accept data? So, Herb, my, my experience may be a little bit different. Uh, from my work in the Army from actually over 15 years ago, uh, we, you know, they, they started developing chronic disease management uh, kind of uh, places of practice within the Department of Primary Care. And what you had is you brought some extended providers, such as a pharmacist, uh, such as nurses, uh, PAs, and they actually ran that show for the things such as the HEDIS measures, your A1C, your asthma, peak flow meter results, your LDL results, you know, did they get a mammogram? Did they get a colonoscopy? Uh, so what we found is that physicians are horrible at keeping track of these things, not because we don't want to. It's because just like George is saying, it takes too much time and it does not fit within our model of practice. So when you get these other people and have them develop a population health clinic, you know, for example, or have them just track these HEDIS measures and automatically they can do the ordering without actually even asking you the physician, that kind of works best. So it's okay. really outside the context of the masters in, in informatics or anything. It, it's really how do you help people achieve what they should be doing without imposing on their time by seeing what others, you know, how could they help you to, you know, get to your goal? I, I'm really hearing, I think there's a lot of alignment among the three of us in terms of how we're thinking about things. It's, um, Think about how to make it easy for clinicians to do the right thing at the right time with the right patient. Um, and when I think about that, I think about what George raised, this idea that clinicians are humans and they're working so hard and they're so busy. Now within the context of COVID, there's this incredible stressor that's been added onto an already pretty stressed system. And that as implementation scientists or folks who are trying to engender change, um, which is all three of us, all four of us are, are trying to do, um, it's really important that we make it easy to principles like changing the choice architecture and the electronic health record um, to make it, to offer prompts and reminders to make things easier for clinicians, to take effort off of their plate, like you're describing by, um, you know, triaging to somebody yeah. who can set an order and uh, do the population health management. Um, and, and so, you know, those principles and then to work things into workflow. Right. A lot of times we ask people to do things that are outside of their workflows and then they never happen because they were not designed to be incorporated into regular care. Um, and so, you know, I just want to say that as a researcher and I am, you know, at the end of the day, a, a researcher, I think the true test of any of these ideas are in the real world under real world circumstances. If we can make work in a pristine environment, that doesn't really mean anything to me because we're not actually having impact and affecting children, families, adults, whoever your patient population is. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. Sani, I'd like to touch on this because change is very difficult for any organization, for any human. And it's also very difficult for business. And I know you're an enthusiast of business journals. What is referred to as the burning platform in the business world? So I, you know, I think you should uh, direct that question to Renad um, because she is much more um, knowledgeable about that and can actually give you a, please go ahead. Renad. No, don't punt it to me. I want to hear what you <laughs> want to say. I want to, you, know, you have to explain the concept to me actually a little bit more. Okay. So the burning platform comes from the oil rigs. Um, and so change doesn't really happen in a human, in an organization, um, anywhere until you see a fire on the platform, the helicopters can't land. You got nowhere to go. So your choices are throw yourself in the water and hope you survive or let the uh, fire catch you and kill you. Not a great choice, but yeah. that motivates change. Uh, and you see it in the diabetic, you see it in the hypertensive. Once they cut one of their toes because of poor circulation, they want to manage that, their diabetes. But it's too late. 
Once you have the heart attack or the stroke, then managing your blood pressure is important, but then it's too late. And so uh, until people feel the pain, they don't seem to want to change. So I'm not, you know, I have a slightly different perspective about that. So not everyone feels that way. So some patients will actually, you know, once something happens, such as you amputate something because of their diabetes that is uncontrolled, they will become compliant and adherent to their medications and their food and exercise, etc. But there is another group of people who actually don't want to and continue not to change or want to change. Uh, so the, the, I think the question is much more complex, Herb, and I think it's okay. because we are people. Uh, it's not a simplistic, uh, let's have the machine, you know, the machines can help us, but again, it's only to a certain extent. If the individual does not want to change, I don't think we've understood really what is going on with them and, you know, what they, what they want. you know, some people, you know, in my clinic, some people will tell me, hey, I'm, I'm done. It's okay. You can let me go. Uh, and so I don't know what the exact answer is, but I think the scalability of implementation, you know, the work that Renad is doing, this has something to do to help us actually identify the answer. So I'm not an academic guy, I'm a clinical guy. Um, and I think I want the academicians to help us trying to understand that and get us to where we need to go. I so, think what happens in the clinical world is you have those that want to and those that are impossible to change. But we as physicians or in the medical community or the academia world, we focus on those that don't want to change, the really hard stuff. And you put all your energy and your resources into that, you will probably fail. I would just put into ones that want to change. You'll make an effort and make those people change. And then once those people start changing, I think the other ones that are against it probably will, you know, flip and change their mind also. You know, uh, I think we waste too much resources on the impossibilities. Go for the low lying fruit. Yeah, it's difficult when it's a kid and you see the, the trajectory. Yeah, yes, it's, it's true. Yes, Renat. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and from an equity perspective, I think that we have to be distributing our efforts across the spectrum because understanding why people do or don't want to change is kind of at the core of what you're saying, Dad. Right? That's right. Like that's right. you need to be able to, and that's true at the patient level, but it's also true at the clinician level, right? Because most of my work focuses on, and for you know, I'm I'm a PhD, I'm a psychologist, I'm not a physician, um, but most of my work focuses on changing clinicians' behavior within organizational constraints. Um, and so, you know, we really need to understand and partner with whether it's a patient or a clinician, what's getting in the way of being able to do that thing. Um, and to, I'm, I'm always really careful to not think of people as being resistant or not, you know, uh, too hard to change because um, if you can understand why people are having a tough time with something then, and partner with them and find a shared mission, you can go so much further. Probably could. Yes. And so, Renad, um, what, is, what is behavioral economics? How does it play into not only changing the physicians and organizations, but the patients and the adherence of these best practices? Yeah, so I'm part of behavioral economics and I came to it. So I've been doing implementation now since about 2005, so around 17 years. Um, and, you know, the field was really nascent when I started doing this work. I came to it actually as a clinician. I kept seeing my patients um, come to our research-based clinic, pediatric anxiety. They had gotten a bunch of treatments out in the community that hadn't gotten better. And they came to our clinic where um, my mentor at the time had developed this evidence-based practice for pediatric anxiety. It's a type of cognitive behavioral therapy. And the kids would get better most of the time, right? And so they'd say to me, I, I thought that, you know, I got treatment before, it didn't work. I didn't think psychological treatment worked. And so I started to ask myself when I saw this observation happening over and over again, why not? 
why don't clinicians in the community offer this evidence-based practice? So I went where most people go, which is um, they think, oh, it's because people don't know how. Have you ever had that thought like, oh, people aren't doing this thing I want. And so it must be because they just don't know or they don't know how. And that was a naive starting point. But actually, if you look at the literature, that's where most people, that's where most people start. Yes. Um, so that's where you started. Uh so... Yep. So I started off with this idea that it was a knowledge gap. And then I did a big study training clinicians. Uh, and, over, and then I spent a lot of time in the public behavioral health system in Philadelphia, which is actually a real innovator and leader in delivering, um, you know, mental health services in the public system. But what I came to understand was the context that clinicians were working within. And that often when we were asking them to do evidence-based practices, it was in a very stressed environment and we're just asking them to do more. And the assumption there is like, if you just work harder and you learn this thing, you'll be able to do this. And I realized that behavioral economics had a lot to offer because what it does is acknowledge A, that humans are humans and that um, we are predictably human in the way that we make decisions. And it also really focuses on how to change the environment to make it easier to do the right thing. So have you ever walked in a cafeteria and seen a bag of chips at the food register? Yes. You grab the bag of chips. Well, what if that's an apple, right? So you grab the apple. It's the same concept of how can we create the environment for clinicians to make it easier for them to do the right thing. And I was really influenced by a study that a colleague of mine did where they looked at a change that was made in the electronic health record where they changed the default in the EHR to be from prescribing name brand drugs to generics. And overnight, the compliance with prescribing generics went up to almost 100% for every drug, but Synthroid, which you all know, drug that uh, patients prefer to prescribe on formulation. And so um, essentially, clinicians could change it if they didn't agree with the default, but it just made that behavior much easier to shape. And so I started to think to myself, implementation science were often throwing the kitchen sink to try to figure out how to change behavior but we should be applying these concepts as the first line of defense always, and then layer on additional more, more costly, less scalable approaches for priorities. And that's where this idea of a learning health system is really important. And you know, I'd be really interested to hear from George, how do you decide what to measure in the dashboard? You have a sense of priorities, right? And those are the things that you're really trying to shape behavior around. So I'd love to hear that because I think that prioritization piece is often left out of the conversation. Right. So the way we do it is, I mean, you're asking doctors to do things. They, they, they're already, there's a list of HEDIS measures for pediatrics and for adult medicine. They're pretty darn simple. Getting it done and measuring it and presenting it is the complicated part. So, you know, people come in for their vaccines, you tell them to get their vaccines, they come in for their checkup, you get your measure, um, you know, whatever is your lead testing or whatever it is. I should not be involved in that. I should just do my daily routine and it should go flow from the EHR to something, which is a centralized dashboard, which houses all the data from different practices with different EHRs. Because usually what happens is with institutions and things, they say, well, we can't measure this unless you come on board to our clunky EHR. And doctors resent that and they won't do that. So they won't do anything. So you have to pull it through some universal language, mix it up and give pretty pictures because that's what doctors want, pretty pictures. They don't want spreadsheets. They're not spreadsheet gurus. Um, they want the end result because they're too busy to look. So they need it red and green. Green so, is so good, red is bad. George, could you share, share like one or two things that you measure across the CIN? Well, a, a difficult one to measure is the HPV, the human papillomavirus vaccine, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of apprehension to getting that vaccine. And it seems to be more so now after COVID for some reason. Um, you know, unfortunately, people who come up with these criteria, they don't see people. You, you got to talk to a mother, you have to, you know, it takes time to convince them. And it, you know, you can't have a hard stop at 13. It should be a little bit longer, but I can understand why they want it at 13, because the immunity is better when they're younger. If, um, but, you know, just finding change and finding ways to get doctors to do it and presenting, you know, that does a good thing. So if you do good things, you make good medicine. 
So, so the HPV is interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. we know best practice is to vaccinate boys and girls. Right. There's two vaccines, and they that will basically eradicate all cervical cancer in the country. Correct. So that there is no justification not to free a woman from cervical cancer, none whatsoever. That's so far into the future that the mother doesn't see it. I thought that the best marketing piece that uh, the company had done was they produced these videos where they show a young adult talking about, you know, mom, I have cervical cancer. When the doctor told you about this vaccine when I was a teenager, maybe you just didn't know. Yeah, they and the guilt on it's interesting. And ma many of the things that you measure are dictated by the government or yeah. the payers. Yeah, um, and the standards are set by them, whether they're real realistic or not. Well, they what what I don't agree with is the, the people that do the research or whatever the heatest measures. They have hard stops. Okay, like for example, they want to get the combo. Uh, two combo three vaccines have a certain amount of vaccines by your second birthday well we discovered a workflow problem that we had in our office where some vaccines you would give it to or catch them up at two but if you do it at two years and one day you fail the measure there's no window they don't have a window you have to have a window and then you fa you fail a big measure you fail a big measure you know there's some monetary uh, repercussions on it well, to me, talking to um, Dr. Cooper uh, was, uh, I, I, know, I, I know James, Dr. James was yeah. sad that in Tennessee, the uh, average population receives only HPV 35% of the time. Yep, that's and true. he's he's been able to get it up to 70%. But that still means that 30% of his patient population is at risk for a disease that we should be able to exterminate, like polio. But because of his efforts, whatever they may be, he is no longer, he had only 30%, he lost 70%. Now he has 70% and he lost 30%. Yeah. You no, know, eventually he'll catch it. You'll never get 100%. No, but it's sad. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people that could be uh, helped. Yeah, but if he did nothing, it would be even sadder because you lost absolutely, 70%. Absolutely, absolutely. But still, so let's it's focus on that one, not that, that other one. That Tennessee's mm -hmm. average is 35%. Yes, Renette. To me, this is one of my favorite implementation app examples. I'm glad you brought it up um, because first of all, and George made this point, there's this issue of temporal discounting or the future, right? Like a lot of the use cases we think about, like, you know, taking your cholesterol medicine or getting an HP vaccine, you don't see the outcome for many, many years. Um, and as humans, from a behavioral economics perspective, we're notoriously bad at kind of understanding the long-term future risk and we kind of focus on the present and the now. Um, then there's intervention characteristics. So it used to be that the vaccine was three doses. I believe that's now, that it's two now. Um, but that's tough. That makes it harder. That introduces friction, right? Like I have to take my kid twice to get their shot, not just once. Um, then there's uh, parent factors, right? Uh, a lot of parents feel uncomfortable talking about the sexuality of their young child related to HPV. And there is this kind of sexual stigma associated with it. Then there's clinician factors. We know that some clinicians don't feel comfortable or might not have self-efficacy around talking about this with, with parents. And then there's you know, organizational factors like the great work George is doing. Is the organization tracking you know, how many of their clinicians are offering and uh, getting parents to agree to the vaccine? And so you can see how these concepts that I've been talking about a little abstractly up until this point are all baked in to what um, you know, this great example that you all just offered. Yes. Um, and then I, I'm going to touch a little bit on mental illness because in pediatrics, we didn't really see an epidemic in, a, in the U.S. of COVID, but we are certainly seeing a, an epidemic of uh, mental illness after COVID in children. And talking a little bit to Sadi, he says it's the same thing in the adult clinic. The amount of anxiety and depression and bipolar is overwhelming. The uh, poor people and minorities don't have where to go to for therapy um, when you do diagnose them. And internists and pediatricians, we're not trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. So we don't have anything more to offer than a prescription for Lexapro. Why, and I know Renat, you studied this issue. Why is it so difficult? In my mind, anxiety, 
we have a concept in pediatrics. It's called the allergic march. The kid will start with a runny nose, then they'll develop eczema, then they'll start wheezing. And in my mind, anxiety develops a march into depression. And if we could stop the anxiety in young kids, maybe we can really make a difference on depression and mental illness going forward. We know cognitive behavioral therapy works. We know there's people like John Kabat-Zinn in Massachusetts who's developed a mindful slash cognitive behavioral therapy approach is a six weeks course. It's been implemented in England after you've been treated for depression and these things work. And yet it's so hard to find a cognitive behavioral therapist uh, in the community, even if you got $250 a week to spend in your child to do this. Why are we so far behind? We have an answer. Oh. Nobody pays for the insurance companies don't believe in it and they don't pay for it. So nobody does it. And the ones that do do it are out of pocket. It's sad. So I was going to say we, uh, we have not developed the mental health infrastructure needed uh, and we do not pay for the services in a way that would produce an environment in which it would be easy uh, to access and receive high quality care for all people in the United States. Um, and I, I do think we're in a moment. Um, listen, if we can't get it right now when the numbers are skyrocketing and, you know, I just read this New York Times article about how the emergency departments are boarding adolescents who are suicidal because there's no psychiatric beds. If mm -hmm. we can't get it right now, I honestly don't know if we'll ever get it right. I, I'm an optimist at heart. And so I do think that this is a moment President Biden announced, you know, that there are going to be significant resources for mental health, for building the mental health infrastructure. We have to think outside of the box. You know, there are great computerized CBT programs that could be made more broadly available. But also, why isn't mental health a core part of school curriculum? That's a very interesting question because it brings me to one of your co-fellow researchers at UPenn. Uh, Dr. Marty S uh, Seligman, who mm -hmm. is the father of positive psychology and one of my heroes. And um, he talks about a simple exercise. The, he calls it the three, 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 uh, prayer, three thankful prayers or the gratitude prayer, where you teach young children in early age to write in a journal three things that they're grateful for every night before they go to bed. And he's got good data that that very simple intervention that can be deployed across every school in America without much of a cost really helps decrease anxiety and makes these kids more resilient. Yet, I don't hear much talk about deploying that. Why? Our system is really focused on serving people only when they become sick. And I think that's true in the physical health arena as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are many colleagues of mine who have been doing prevention work in the schools for many years. Um, kids, schools are where kids spend the majority of their time. There's no excuse for why, um, you know, socio-emotional prevention related curriculum are not more widely deployed in a really consistent and even way across our country. But I also want to say, Herb, that like that exercise is wonderful. And, and I, I'm not actually familiar with it. So I need to look at the evidence, but I believe that it could be effective. But um, it's going to take more than that. You know, this year, the Surgeon General, the American Academy of Pediatrics, almost all the pediatric organizations have declared an emergency in the mental health of our country um, for young people. You know, they're facing, you know, we have almost 200,000 kids at last count who have been orphaned because of COVID. There's climate change, there's school shootings. Like, I wanna be really clear that doing a mindfulness exercise at school and doing that at scale is not going to solve the problem that we're in right now. We really need to develop infrastructure at every level, including universal prevention, and then addressing the needs of kids at risk and then the specialty needs of kids who are now at a place where they have a diagnosis. We need to invest in it. We need to invest in the workforce and we need to think outside of the box in terms of how technology can support their care as well. But technology alone is not gonna solve that. We've seen 
thousands of apps be developed that don't have any evidence base. And we know that people engage with that technology once and then don't use it again. And so this is going to need to be a person mediated solution, but technology can certainly be helpful. Could, could you say that one more time? A person? A, a person mediated solution. Yeah. Okay. People I, I like relationships. Yes. yes. I, I like that. that. That's at the core of what this podcast is. Yeah. You, you need a conversation. You need to develop deep, lasting relationships uh, with your colleagues, your physicians, your communities to really make a change. No piece of technology is going to solve no problem. It's just one more tool. Um, and so I, I wanted to talk about one more concept because it's really important for me, Renat. And that is the concept of uh, neuroplasticity the ability of the brain to change beyond seven years of age. When I went to medical school, we were told the brain and the lungs stop growing at seven. But what you don't get right in your brain by the time you're seven years old, too bad. What's the science behind that today, Renat? This is not my area of science. So what I'm sharing with you is more just me kind of keeping up with the literature and, and knowing what's going on. but. Um, my understanding is that the brain is highly malleable. There have been some really interesting studies that have actually shown that after kids get CBT, there's changes that go on in the brain. And that's the extent of which I could uh, describe it uh, that demonstrate that the brain is changing in response to cognitive behavioral therapy, which is, I think, fascinating. Um, so I think there's so much more to learn, but my mental model is that the brain is highly malleable um, uh, until... Um, we are no more, um, uh, but that is based on my beliefs and not necessarily uh, science that I've conducted. I think you're right that they have shown the same thing in college students that go through a small exercise in meditation. They are not super meditators like John Kabat-Zinn or, or the, the happy monk for chart. Uh, they're just regular kids in college. They go through a small meditation exercise and then they do uh, functional MRIs on them, and they see the frontal lobe lights up uh, in a very small amount of time. So one would think that the same thing would happen in kids after proper cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is really um, uplifting and optimistic. I want the listeners who are not doctors out there to, uh, to know that you can change and that you can't go from an anxious, worrying mind to a happy mind. Um, and that you can't get uh, help with depression and other mental illnesses so that you have a happy functional life full of, full of pleasure and family and good things that you deserve. Um, so I want to go a little bit more into something that I was very interesting in, and I loved your YouTube talk. Um, it was about gun locks and the prevention of suicide because as you alluded and your dad um, mentioned to me and You'll hear many pediatricians tell you the same thing in the emergency room and in the office. Um, we're overwhelmed with kids with anxiety, depression, kids who want to commit suicide. Uh, it seems like the last three years have been extremely stressful for society as a whole. Um, and you've done some research on how to prevent some, if not all of these suicides. Um, what would you like to share with us today? Um, what I'd like to share is that there is a low cost scalable approach to, um, you know, increasing secure firearm storage in homes, which is a universal prevention strategy um, for suicide. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background because I think it's helpful context. Um, so we know in the US, one in three um, homes have a firearm and those numbers have actually increased uh, in in COVID and the civil unrest that has followed, um, uh, a lot of people are buying guns uh, that don't necessarily have a background in firearm safety. Uh, and so uh, we know that there's a lot of guns in homes. Uh, we also know that the suicide rate in our country has unfortunately been increasing um, over the past decade. It's been increasing most steeply um, in minoritized and mar marginalized communities. Um, and we know that um, firearms are the most lethal method of attempt. Um, so over 90% uh, of young people who attempt with a firearm die. 
um, which is not true of other mechanisms. Um, and so there's been some great simulation model work that's shown that if more firearms were stored securely, um, that we could prevent up to 32% of uh, firearm deaths. We also know, and this paper just came out this last year, actually, that firearm, firearms are now the leading cause of death in young people in the United States. And so there's this very simple uh, uh, program that was developed by Dr. Terry Barkin and colleagues um, at Vanderbilt and tested in a large pragmatic trial in lots of pediatrician offices. And it, it was a more involved um, than just firearm focused. We've been focusing in the firearm component. It's called the safety track. And it basically included screening for firearms in the house having a brief discussion between the pediatrician and the parent about the importance of secure storage and offering a free cable lock. Um, that trial demonstrated that that intervention resulted in more secure firearm storage. There's also been other studies done um, that show that secure firearm storage are related to um, you know, uh, decreased deaths. Um, and so we took that program, the safety check, we adapted it um, and in partnership with firearm owning parents, with clinicians, um, and we've renamed it Safe Firearm. Um, and now it just is comprised of actually just having that brief conversation and offering cable locks to all parents um, and really focusing it in on, on universal suicide prevention. The initial study was really focused on unintentional injury in young kids. So we're now doing a um, 30 clinic trial um, in Michigan and Colorado, where we're testing, changing the electronic health record well child visit template to have a prompt around the program, um, so doing that for all clinics. And then half the clinics are also getting something called facilitation, which is a PEDS or primary care practice implementation strategy to support them in incorporating a new practice into their clinic. So half the clinics will just get the nudge in the EHR and half will get the nudge plus facilitation. Um, and hopefully at the end of the trial, we'll be able to advise health systems on which approach might be most effective um, at implementing this program in their health systems. At the end of the day, if um, that's all too complicated, have a conversation with your, uh, your patients and their parents about uh, secure firearm storage. Um, if you can access cable locks and give them out for free as a safety device, do so. There's a lot of organizations that are now making them available for free. You could partner with them um, or with your local police station, um, and you could save a life. Um, you know that uh, unfortunately, firearms account for a large proportion of suicide deaths. Um, and what we want to do is put time and space in between um, feelings of suicidal ideation or a suicidal plan and having access to means, because we know that once a little bit of time passes, those feelings pass. Um, and unfortunately, if someone has access to a firearm in that time, the likelihood of them dying is very high. So I was very interested that one of your uh, focus groups was uh, uh, gun owners or um, mm -hmm. people who had to use guns at work. Um, why did you find out when you uh, did those focus groups? Yeah, so we did some interviews um, with various stakeholders, um, including firearm owners, including people who are firearm safety course instructors. What I have found is that the firearm community has been tremendously welcoming to me and my research team um, in partnering around a shared mission to keep young kids safe. Um, and that firearm owners and firearm safety course instructors um, want to ensure that pediatricians have this conversation in a non-judgmental, respectful way, um, acknowledging uh, Second Amendment rights, and also that nobody wants their kid to not be safe, and that we're all on the same page about that. And so there's a lot of discourse about, you know, um, firearm rights in our country. This is not about that. This is just about keeping kids safe. And if you can stay grounded in that and kind of continue returning to that, um, and uh, have a conversation in a non-judgmental, respectful way. Um, people feel really good about pediatricians providing anticipatory guidance on this topic, just like they do on all kinds of other things. I actually had this light bulb moment. My young child and I were at the pediatrician's office, and they were asking me all these questions about car seats and smoke alarms, and they never asked me if I had a firearm or if I stored it securely. That's an opportunity to save a life. Great. And you also said something that I really appreciated on your um, 
YouTube talk. You said, when it's issues that are very divisive like this, we need to keep politics out of it. Why is that so important? Podcasts, or, uh, but I think it's all about that shared mission and coming together around something we can all agree upon. I think often politics then put us in a kind of us versus them scenario. Um, and so, you know, again, our team, our partners, we all agree that we want young kids safe, happy, healthy, and alive. And that's all that matters. It's, it's, it's none of that other stuff enters into these conversations. Yes, that's very important. George, I wonder, um, do most of the practice in the CIN um, ask about gun, or, gun ownership or is not an issue in Long Island? I'm sure it's an issue somewhere in Long Island. I'm not sure if people ask about it per directly. I'm sure we have a lot of police officers and detectives. I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. I used to have FBI agents that came to the urgent care and they always had the gun either in their purse or in their hip. That they never leave the house without it. Um, yeah. Sadi, um, I'm very concerned about all these and, 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 uh, Renard mentioned this, all these non-evidence-based practices uh, in the area of med tech or apps or app-like things that are popping up. Uh, I think the worst was Cerebral uh, that was prescribing Adderall, Adderall, Xanax, Ativan to anyone who called for any reason. Um, there's others out there. For example, there's one that keeps popping up on my Instagram uh, feed about attention deficit disorder coaches. They're not therapists. There's no data behind it. Uh, there's another one that is using child life specialists to help your child in the event of a mental health crisis for $175 for a 45 minute, minute video call. Um, we already have a disaster of mental illness in this country. Uh, we don't have the right resources. We have a lot of uh, shame or, uh, you know, people don't want to, they're embarrassed that they have anxiety or depression. And we're not using best practices. How do we elevate the, the tech that may be helpful and change the world while walk away from these other things that may be harmful to society as a whole? Yeah, I've heard uh, that anytime you have a new technology that comes in, there's a learning period that people go through. Uh, and we may, you know, uh, just like in the Industrial Revolution over 100 years ago, uh, initially, a lot of things were going wrong. For example, a lot of workers used to die or get injured secondary to the new uh, all the new stuff that was industrially built, but without the safety nets uh, into making sure that an instrument does not take a worker's arm, uh, all the occupational hazards that were associated with it. And I think with this information age, we kind of are going through the same thing. We're still early into it. Uh, although maybe 30, 40 years sounds like it's a long time, but it's actually we're still in a learning phase. Uh, and these apps, the iPhone only became available in 2007. Uh, so it's yeah. barely, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, and so I think a lot of people will continue on developing stuff until we have a clear understanding um, and until you have sufficient regulatory oversight um, for developing things that you know patients may use, uh, I, I wish I, I wish this was done earlier. But again, you know, just like Renat said, everything we do is downstream rather than upstream, where we should have developed the processes to prevent these things in the first place from happening. They shouldn't have come to the market in the first place before they're actually associated with trials that show that they're useful for human beings. Yeah, it, it it's, you know, it's a problem. It's a problem because 
people are not literate in healthcare, less, le less so in mental health. And they're looking for a solution and an app pops up and they may waste a lot of money and worse yet, they might end up with a poor outcome. Uh, That's where the doctor comes in, the relationship with the patient to tell them you should do this or you should not do this. Yeah. Doctors yeah. cannot be replaced by a computer app. I don't care what anybody tells me. No. We possible. all agree on that. Not possible. I don't think the tech world does. I think that the tech, tech world. I don't think they realize that too. They, they, they think it's a fast bullet that will solve the whole problem. Yeah. Um, it makes them money perhaps, or there's some other monetizing incentives. Well, that's what it is. Monetizing incentives that they're interested in and moving on to the next one. So uh, I tend to be a little critical and pessimistic if you haven't noticed. So what, what optimistic uh, notes do we want to end this podcast on, Sadi? Um, what do you think with bright, bright in the future? Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's wonderful that there's this something that's called implementation. Because when I started and used to implement things, you know, whether it's the electronic medical record or all the other technology that comes in, um, we were doing it without really understanding how to, how to do it. You know, we just do it locally. But when I wanted to do it in another place, you would fail. Um, and so the scaling piece, I'm, I'm very happy that there's this implementation science that's come in and has made it a rigorous exercise in academics to really understand um, how we should go ahead and, you know, change things uh, for physicians and for others as well. Yeah. Great. Um, how about you? Uh, what do you think, Renaud? What do you think you're optimistic about the future? So I kind of think implementation science is baked into my DNA. I remember my dad talking about his experiences as a physician when I was very young. Um, and, you know, you wanted me to be an MD, but I, I think I think this worked out. I think so. Um, but I, I remember really thinking about the importance of equitable, easy to access healthcare. I even wrote a poem when I was, I think I was 10, Somewhere called around. Insurance, Please. And so... I, um, I feel optimistic, A, about this opportunity to be on a podcast with my dad and um, to continue to learn from him. You know, I really love that analogy you gave of the Industrial Revolution and also the future of my children and what they might do in healthcare or where, whatever they choose in the future. Um, kids are our future, and um, I'm glad to see a podcast focused on kids and relationships and rebuilding after a couple of really difficult years. How about you, George? What are you really optimistic about? Oh, I was afraid you were gonna ask me that. <laughs> well, I guess what saddens me is I speak to a lot of physicians and when they ask me, should my kid go to medical school? They say, no, that saddens me a lot. My son is in medical school. I believe in physicians. I believe in private enterprise, private practice. Um, and I think I'm a, becoming a dinosaur. I think the technology companies are trying to replace the physician. I think the MBAs are trying to do things that, you know, the business people in the hospitals and in the universities are trying to replace the physician with lower pay you know, providers. I think, um, you know, the academic people, they're good people. Somebody has to do research because I can't. Um, but I, I think the, the researchers need to, to, to have a, a rude awakening of what a physician patient relationship is. You know, I'll give you an example. They just changed all the bright futures, developmental screening things, questionnaires very complicated, very cumbersome. I'm wondering whether half the people use it anymore, where the old one was perfectly fine. No thought about implementation. No, or how, they just throw you know, a bunch of get, words. That's right. And, they just and throw a no bunch thought. of words in a computer and they think that the computer yeah. is gonna grade it. And, you know, they're- Or if it's useful to the patient or how the customer, who is the parent in our, right. in our 
it perceives that? Is it any value to them? Because half the time when I cover somebody's practice, they go like, why am I filling all these forms? My yeah. kid's healthy. Yeah. So you you know, to know when to use it and when not to use it. That's right. You know, so and I, I think a lot of people are trying to replace that physician person. You know, I'll give you a great analogy. I, I was speaking with a friend of mine. I, I, I play in a band, right? One of the guys used to be was a tech support guy. He fixed computers. And I had asked him about how do I, I had a hard drive that crashed and I looked on YouTube, said if you put it in the freezer and you, you make it cold, and then you connect it to this hub, you can do this, and then you can take the data off of the thing and put it onto another computer. And um, I told him that story. He says, yeah, you can do that. I said, so why does your job exist? Because I just looked it up on YouTube. And you know what his answer to me was? Because I'm the guy that pushes enter and told you you can do that. <laughs> That's your doctor. Okay? Yeah. Well. So it's interesting, right? Yes. That's so, what I'm the guy that pushes enter and tells you, don't worry. Or I'm the guy that tells you, you really should worry. So when I see Renat and Sadi, um, it reminds me of why I became a pediatrician. And basically, I was taught a child is a blank canvas. Uh, you don't know what they will be. They may be the person that takes care of your cancer uh, as you're dying or they may be the person that becomes the next president of the United States, or they may just be a phenomenal parent. So when I see a really good friend like Sadi, and then I see his daughter blossom into this great researcher with 200 publications and $31 million in grant money, and at the young age of hers, uh, already chair of a department, it feel, fills my heart with gratitude that I have been able to have this friendship with your dad and that I saw you as a little child and that I've seen your, your own child and that through all this time, we've, became, we've uh, been able to use technology to remain friends. Um, and that is a great gift in my life. And as well as George, George, uh, George has been a new friend, but is a great uh, gift in my life. And that fills me with great joy and pleasure every day. And I wanted to thank all three of you uh, for that and for being part of this experiment where we have conversations and we build relationships and we say what's great about what we do for humanity as a community. Uh, so thank you very much to the three of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for this having us. This has been us. a fantastic uh, opportunity to be with you. You know, this is the, this is the first successful um, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, endeavor that Renad and I do together. Um, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I, I, I kind of wrote a paper and wanted her to uh, help me with it. I tried it. to fix it. That's right. And you couldn't get it over the finish I couldn't line. Get it, I couldn't get it right. That's the problem. Um, and so thank you for bringing us together to do that today. Thank you for taking time off of your vacation, Cape May. Of course, sir. And yeah. hugs and kisses to Amal and the children and your husband. Thank you. And George, I would love to chat more. What you're doing is fascinating and yeah. um, could be really interesting partnership. I, I love hearing about great work like the work you're leading. So keep great. it up. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank 